over avocado toast. There's a new breakfast item set to break the bank. A cafe has taken Vegemite on toast to the next level, charging a whopping $7. The dish includes a quenelle of butter, that's that thing on the left, and a smear of Vegemite, that's that thing in the middle, with two pieces of sourdough toast Jeez. there on the right. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And last week, that Vegemite Cafe special was big news in almost all the mainstream media. And it sure had the TV talkers in a lava. So look how it's presented. This is at a cafe in Newcastle. It looks pretty fancy, right? It's deconstructed Vegemite on toast. <laughs> the $7 is punishment for ordering something you could have easily made at home. I refer to that streak of Vegemite as looking like a skid mark. Yes, it was even on your ABC, home to all the important news. So how on earth did it become a story? Well, like so much of what passes for news today, it came from social media and a single Instagram post from one Newcastle cafe customer. Gourmet Vegemite on toast. This is just ridiculous. Tasty, but ridiculous. Ridiculous enough to grab a dozen journalists' attention, starting with one enterprising reporter at news.com.au who at least realised what a stupid story it was. There's a fair bit of drama going on in the world right now. Despite all these important but insane international events worthy of our time and emotional energy, the thing Australians are most outraged about right now is a plate of Vegemite toast. And who says they're outraged? Why, the media, of course. In story after story after story. Even making the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Can you believe it? And then, even more incredibly, popping up on news sites around the world. Restaurants deconstructed Vegemite on toast dish enrages the internet. Bizarre, isn't it? And even more bizarre that The Guardian hired a freelancer in Newcastle to go out and sample the smear firsthand. The price is hard to swallow, but justified by the sourdough. It is at once crispy and soft and sourced from a Vietnamese bakery. And then there are the sprinkled microherbs. But, as always, the Telegraph saw it all as something far more sinister and turned the toast into yet more evidence that the world has gone mad. Sourdough taste as avo lunacy spreads to Vegemite. Copping a serving of millennial madness. And that allowed the paper, on behalf of, quote, everyday Australians, to then take aim at hipsters, millennials and inner-city cafe culture and find a chef to describe the dish as un-Australian and tantamount to treason. And one can only assume they're serious. But for heaven's sake, who is really going mad here? The cafe or the media? But now to the real story of the week, which is the fallout from the Banking Royal Commission. The Treasurer has warned executives of insurance giant AMP they face prison over confessions that have been made at the Banking Royal Commission. What has occurred here and what has been admitted to in the Royal Commission by AMP is deeply disturbing. This type of behaviour can attract penalties which include jail time. That's how serious these things are. Yes, the evidence at the Royal Commission has been explosive, with AMP admitting it lied to the corporate watchdog ASIC on 20 separate occasions, and also admitting it charged fees to its customers for services they did not receive. Commonwealth Bank confessed it was guilty of doing the same and agreed it was a gold medalist in the sport of ripping off its clients. And then came the revelation that the bank had knowingly ripped off the dead. So far, the Commission has heard from Commonwealth Bank executive Marianne Perkovich, who has admitted the bank charged fees to clients they knew had died. It is astonishing stuff from a Royal Commission the government never wanted and did everything in its power to avoid. And in the wake of those dramatic revelations, we've seen some remarkable political confessions, like this one. In the past, I argued against a royal commission into banking. I was wrong. What I have heard so far is beyond disturbing. The commission's opponents in the media, like Sky's Andrew Bolt, have also lined up to admit their error. Confession. I thought that this royal commission into financial institutions wouldn't uncover anything that we really didn't know already. Wrong. And Bolt was by no means alone. Here is the Australian's senior business commentator John Dury back in June 2016 on why we don't need a banking royal commission, calling it a complete waste of time and arguably a touch dangerous. And here he is last Thursday delivering his mayor culpa. 
This column admittedly was not originally a proponent of the Royal Commission, but now acknowledges it was wrong. This column? You're the one who writes it, John. We'll see how many others fess up, but trust me, the list is long. Here's the AFR's Tony Boyd in April 2016, for example, branding it a very bad idea and claiming... The last thing Australia needs is a royal commission into our world-class banking system. And here is the Daily Telegraph's Simon Benson in August 2016, waxing lyrical and telling readers... The proposal for a royal commission into the banks is one of the most brazen exploitations of a public mood disposed toward anti-elitism. Its aim is entirely political, cornering Turnbull into being the former investment banker now defending the banks. And here is News Corp's syndicated business columnist Terry McCran adding his voice to the chorus last year, bemoaning the fact that Australia seemed to be... Tumbling inexorably towards a completely unnecessary, politically cynical, stupid and potentially harmful Royal Commission. And McCran did not back down when it was announced, despite support from voters, saying it was an inquiry... The country and bank customers most certainly do not need. Judith Sloan, who writes on economics for The Australian, was yet another determined naysayer, pronouncing... In my view, there is no case for a Royal Commission into banking. And bizarrely, a November editorial in the AFR suggested that conspiracy theories were driving demand for an inquiry and asked... What is the problem with the banks that a broad-brushed inquiry supposedly would fix? As we all now know, the answer to that could be months in the telling. Because last Friday, the fallout began. The Banking Royal Commission has claimed its first major scalp with AMP Chief Executive Craig Miller stepping down just moments ago. We will go straight to our finance editor, Ross Greenwood. Ross, good morning. This is a dramatic development. Well, as if the Royal Commission into banks couldn't get any bigger with some of the revelations we've seen so far. Yep, Ross Greenwood is another opponent of the Commission who's had to change his view. So, why were so many pundits so sure it was a waste of time? Well, perhaps because much of the pressure to have it came from Labor. So to support the Royal Commission was to give succour to the enemy, or at least to Bill Shorten. But clearly those experts who assured us the banks and regulators were doing a great job also had no idea what they were talking about. As Sky's Janine Perrett tweeted last week... I thought nothing could shock me anymore. But in my 40 years as a journo, most of it covering business, I have never seen anything as appalling as what we are witnessing at the Banking Royal Commission. And I covered the 80s crooks, including Bond and Scase. And all that from an inquiry that so many in the media told us wasn't needed and would tell us nothing. Oh, how wrong they were. But now to another disaster and fresh news of the appalling damage suffered by Australia's biggest tourist attraction. Scientists say the Great Barrier Reef was forever changed by a catastrophic marine heat wave in 2016. A two-year study of the extreme weather found the southern reef was mostly untouched, but many coral communities up north died instantly in the hot water. They didn't die slowly of starvation. They died directly of heat stress. They cooked because the temperatures were so extreme. That ABC News report featuring Professor Terry Hughes followed on from his shocking study published in Nature last week, which revealed that almost a third of the Great Barrier Reef suffered catastrophic coral dieback in the Great Bleaching of 2016. Hughes's two-year survey found that two-thirds of the coral on that one-third of the reef is now dead and unlikely to grow back for a decade or more. And he had this warning for the future. The incidence of coral bleaching around the world is increasing, driven by global warming. But there was much less alarm over this bad news and very little fanfare at The Australian, which gave the story this strange headline. Not all scientists agree on cause of Great Barrier Reef damage. And which opened up with this first paragraph from Environment Editor Graham Lloyd. The ecology of a third of the Great Barrier Reef had been transformed by coral bleaching by 2016 and may never fully recover. But not all scientists were prepared to say that climate change was definitely to blame. Well, no doubt that's true. Unanimity is hard to find. But Professor Hughes, who's a world expert on coral bleaching, was blaming climate change and a bunch of experts were on record agreeing with him. So, who did the Australian find to disagree? Jochen Kamp, an oceanographer in the College of Science and Engineering at Flinders University, said the claimed link between the 2016 heatwave and global warming has no scientific basis. The Australian took Kamp's comment from CIMEX, the Science Media Exchange, which offered reaction to the Nature study from seven experts in the field. 
of which Dr Kampf was the only one not to give resounding support to Hughes's conclusions. But it wasn't just the Australian that seized on Kampf's claim, with News Corp's Cairns Post also using a turbocharged version of the quote to lead their story. Link between Great Barrier Reef bleaching and global warming has no scientific basis. Researcher. So, does Jochen Kampf not believe in man-made global warming? Well, actually, yes, he does. In fact, in August 2016, he was one of 154 scientists who signed an open letter to Malcolm Turnbull, calling on the Australian government to tackle the root causes of an unfolding climate tragedy and do what is required to protect future generations and nature, including meaningful reductions of Australia's peak carbon emissions and coal exports while there is still time. That famous open letter cited soaring global temperatures, a rise in greenhouse gas levels, an increase in extreme weather events, including in Australia, and an increase in acidity affecting coral reefs as major causes of concern. So, what was Camp actually trying to say about this latest reef study? Well, it is a far more technical point than the Cairns Post or the Australian made it out to be. Because, Dr Kampf told MediaWatch... Technically, one cannot link an observed heat wave that lasted only several weeks to global warming, which requires measurements over a much longer time span. But he then went on to say that the coral bleaching of 2016 was serious and sad and that... Global warming via ocean acidification in conjunction with marine heat waves, such as that observed in 2016, poses a severe threat to the health of the Great Barrier Reef. Hence, more effort is required to protect this important region. Now that is not the message you'd have got from the Cairns Post headline, which Dr Kampf described as grossly misleading. Or indeed from the Australian. But no surprises there, because both have form for downplaying the reef's grief. Back in 2016, for example, the Australian ignored 2,500 of the world's coral reef experts who were warning that... Coral reefs are threatened with complete collapse under rapid climate change. In their place, it unearthed a scientist who specialises in bird migration who disagreed with the 2,500 experts, and they ran with the headline... The bleaching of parts of the reef is dividing the scientific world. And last year, when the Great Barrier Reef Authority's dire warning about the impact of coral bleaching was making news around the world, the Australian also failed to report it in the paper. At least, this time, they've covered the story, but they just couldn't resist twisting it for their readers. And finally, to the courts, where on Friday the Daily Telegraph suffered another major setback in its defence of this front-page story on actor Geoffrey Rush. As we told you last week, the telly was seeking permission to sue the Sydney Theatre Company on the grounds that the STC was partly responsible for the offending story. And in so doing, the telly revealed one of its confidential sources in breach of its own code of ethics. But on Friday, Justice Michael Wigney threw out the Telegraph's claim. As the ABC reported from the federal court... This was like, you know, this was a a shellacking. This was, uh, you know, a comprehensive uh, victory at this early preliminary stage to Geoffrey Rush. Um, The judge said that, uh, you know, the the Daily Telegraph is uh, trying to hinder his ability to clear his name and described the tactics as desperate. Justice Wigney was also scathing about the telly's courtroom tactics. As Nine News reported, the judge said... The idea of a major media organisation and one of its journalists suing a source in a defamation action is, to say the least, unusual. The proposed cross-claim against Sydney Theatre Company is weak and tenuous. It also said that Nationwide News, which publishes the Daily Telegraph, and its reporter, Jonathan Moran, were quick to publish but slow to defend. A hearing has now been set down for September the 3rd, but with the judge ordering the parties to go to mediation, we would not be surprised if the Telegraph doesn't settle the case. Either way, it's not looking good for the tabloid. And there's more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website, where you can get a transcript and download the programme. You can also catch up with us on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. And don't forget, Media Bytes every Thursday. Q&A is up next, but for now until next week, that's it from us. Goodbye. (laughs) 